Hello, I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers50 and director of the Business Ecosystem Alliance. Welcome to our second webinar of 2022. Every month we bring you interesting discussion, insights, research and best practice from the world of business ecosystems. So thank you for joining us today and we look forward to some great sessions in the months ahead. As always, please feel free to offer your questions, thoughts and opinions during the session. And I'm delighted that today's session is led by someone whose work we have long admired, Shamin Prashanthan. Shamin is the author of Gorillas Can Dance, a uh, very fine book, Gorillas Can Dance, Lessons from Microsoft and Other Corporations on Partnering with start Startups, newly published by Wiley. You can see further information at gorillascandance.com. Uh, Shamin is a professor of international business and strategy at Siebes in Shanghai. He is joined by two great guests today, so a practical and stimulating discussion is guaranteed. Shamin will introduce them in a moment. So over to you, Shamin. Many thanks once again for joining us today. Stuart, thank you very much for your kind introduction and this fantastic opportunity. Uh, as Stuart mentioned, I've been doing research on how large companies uh, partner with startups and uh, the result of this uh, of about 15 years of research is this book, uh, Gorillas Can Dance. And I'm delighted that two uh, pioneering corporate innovators who've worked in this space have agreed to be part of this panel. Uh, Jeremy Bassett, who uh, helped to create Unilever Foundry and is now CEO of CoCute. Uh, and Shruti Kannan, who is uh, head of Cisco Launchpad in Bangalore, a uh, recent recipient of a top corporate innovator award uh, uh, in December, and uh, someone also who has a lot of experience in this area. So it's also very nice that we have um, a mix of a, a geographic focus, although both work have been involved in very global initiatives, um, uh, Jeremy is based in, in the UK, um, Shruti in India, and one of the interesting things I, I, I discovered in my work is that both advanced and emerging economies have very interesting ecosystems of startups that um, corporations can leverage. Also, Jeremy uh, uh, worked for a company from a more traditional sector, uh, Shruti at Cisco is part of a uh, digitally native company, if you will. And again, it just goes to show the, the relevance of engaging with startups to a range of corporations. Uh, to set the tone, I'd like to share just a few uh, thoughts from the book. Uh, and then I will invite uh, Jeremy first and then Shruti to share a few opening remarks and then we can have uh, some questions and answers. Feel free to post your questions and I will do my best to uh, include them in the discussion. So this work, Gorillas Can Dance, is the result of over 15 years of research and Microsoft is one of the companies I've been fortunate to study for well over a decade. Uh, and so I start with a very quick glimpse uh, on the next slide with um, the uh, Microsoft startup partnering journey. And in the next few slides, you're going to see pictures of different people. This is Dana Lewin, who was probably the first uh, big influence in this journey, who used to work for Apple, uh, a Silicon Valley insider, who was brought into Microsoft by Steve Barmer to sort of point the way to Silicon Valley. Although Microsoft is a West Coast company, they were a bit of an outsider in Silicon Valley. And Dana kickstarted this process well over a decade ago. And then, as you'll see on the next slide, Zach Weisfeld in Israel uh, sort of took the baton and leveraged the startup nation's thriving ecosystem, creating a corporate accelerator. And this model was then scaled up to different locations. I think on the next slide, you'll see someone from China, James Chow, who's driving this initiative in China. And by now, was able to say Microsoft loves startups, which you'll also see on a on the table. Oh, um, in, in a moment, you'll see it on the table uh, of Satya Nadella. This is Doug McMillan of Walmart, uh, who was in Shanghai before the pandemic, um, you know, restricted travel. And he was looking at how Walmart was engaging with startups in China. And all these startups were actually alumni 
of the Microsoft Accelerator. So that's the link to Microsoft there. Uh, and now Satya is saying, well, Microsoft loves startups. And so what this really is saying is that even uh, you know, large companies face disruption, feel the need to reinvent themselves. And one way to do this, um, the co-aligning with this new strategy uh, is to be more entrepreneurial and consider engaging with startups. But that, of course, involves thinking about the how uh, and uh, leveraging different ecosystems in different parts of the world. In terms of the why, very briefly, um, what, what, what you'll see uh, in the next couple of slides is basically the idea that big companies need to be more entrepreneurial. And so as I, I um, Jeremy, if you wouldn't mind moving uh, on, on to the next slide, the basic point, and I think everybody gets this, is that there is a potential win-win. Uh, each side has something the other wants, scale uh, and agility. Uh, but the problem, uh, as I say on the next slide, is that there is a challenge um, and in fact, I, I have a quote from Jeremy in, uh, to kick off that chapter. It's very difficult for a large organization to stimulate the same sort of incentives and flexibility that exist for an entrepreneur, uh, he says. And so uh, we have this paradox of asymmetry, as I point out on the next slide, which is that the very things that make it attractive to work together also makes it difficult. There's asymmetry of goals, of structure, and of attention in the sense that big companies see an ocean of startups out there and aren't sure which startups are worthy of their scarce managerial attention. The startups know who the big companies are, but struggle to attract the attention of the people who matter, which brings us to the crux of what we will focus on today, which is the how. And here I make a couple of points. The first is that it's important to partner with startups systematically to address these asymmetries, but also over time, uh, it's important to build a capability to partner with these startups. So in terms of the systematic way of partnering, uh, three steps that I identify on the next slide are the importance of clarifying what the synergy is uh, to address the goal asymmetry. It sounds blindingly obvious, but it's not always clear. Creating interfaces so that startups have a clear port of call to address the structure asymmetry. And then thirdly, the importance of cultivating success stories so that both sides understand what success might look like and can allocate their attention accordingly. In some cases, startups may realize, well, this isn't the large company for me to partner. And large companies get a better idea of which startups to partner with and how to make this process work. And you, you can think of synergies in terms of building blocks. You know, technology companies like Cisco and Microsoft tend to have more of a, um, uh, you know, a, a focus of getting startups to build on top of their technology, whereas companies like Unilever, BMW, and so on may have pain points that startups can help address, particularly around digitalization. And in terms of the interface, uh, there are different ways that companies have developed to do this. One is, and one approach is more of a cohort, like an accelerator model. I say to my MBA students, it's like an MBA class, getting in is difficult but pretty much everybody who gets in will complete the program unless they screw up really badly uh, there's a fixed time a fixed curriculum and peer interaction is a big part of it whereas the funnel is like the job search process after the mba many fewer finish the process than begin uh, you get screened out along the way and you may not know who else is part of the process funnels i find are very useful for predictable outcomes cohorts have the advantage of serendipity you know, two startups that didn't know each other from Adam might form a three-way partnership with the large corporation. Obviously, the pandemic has changed the way these cohorts operate, but many uh, of these programs have successfully uh, moved online. I would categorize Unilever Foundry as more of the funnel model and uh, the Cisco launchpad more of an accelerator model. And just the final thing I would say uh, before inviting Jeremy is, Companies like Jeremy's and, and Shruti's, what they have done well over time, as I point out in the, in the final slide that I want to present, is they have developed this over time. You know, you know understanding the process is one thing uh, and you can get started, but to really embed this in, in the company and institutionalize this, it has to expand 
and then be systematized and brought uh, and, and aligned with the strategic imperatives of this of the company and by the way one of the reasons why i like to show pictures of people that i've spoken to is to remind um, all of us that at the end of the day though we talk about organizations partnering with each other it comes down to people and two of the finest i have had the privilege to engage with in my research are jeremy and shruti and i now invite then first jeremy and then shruti to share some thoughts uh, on how they have experienced this phenomenon, and then we will open up for questions. Uh, Shamin, that was a fantastic um, setup, and I, I, I mean, a great overview of an amazing book as well. And congratulations on that book. I think there's such a it's such a good uh, guidance for people that are, are well and truly in the trenches here as to how to accelerate that, or people that might be embarking on this journey for the first time as well. There's lo loads of treasures in there. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm Jeremy Bassett. I, I now run a company called CoCubed, uh, which helps corporates to work with startups. Uh, but uh, as uh, Shamin said, in 2013, I set up this thing called the Unilever Foundry, which is Unilever's platform to work with startups. And I thought I'd take you through uh, the journey of getting that up and running and also uh, take you through a bit of an overview of, of how it worked and, and why I think it worked. Um, so the Foundry was a product, you know, I've been, when I launched the Foundry in 2013, I'd been at Unilever for over 10 years at that time. And I had always wrestled with, how do you take this entrepreneurial background that I grew up with uh, in Australia and bring that to life at the scale of a corporate? Uh, and that was really the thing that I was always challenging. And, and uh, whenever we uh, looked outside, we realized actually there were startups that were starting to eat away at our business that they had what we wanted in terms of they had the innovation and we had the, what they wanted, which was the scale. And so the, the key natural question to ask then is, well, how do we work together? How can we get gorillas to dance as Shamin writes? And, um, and that was sort of the first um, premise for this. The second thing that came about was we had tried to start new businesses in Unilever several times. And we've done this in isolation from the core business. And I think this idea of synergy that Shamin writes about is absolutely foundational because unless you've got a demand or a requirement that's coming from the core of the business, then it's a bit futile trying to start. And so the process of the foundry uh, was very simple in many ways. It was this, it was launching the, uh, starting with a brief and then pitch pilot partner. And as Shamin mentions, this is much more of a funnel approach rather than an accelerator program or a cohort based uh, initiative. Uh, but what we would always do is we'd start with a brief and partly this was act by accident, right? So when I put together the proposal for the foundry, uh, my, my, my line manager at the time was not very supportive. Uh, we could not release any budgets. Uh, so I, this was like a passion project. It was a 20% time project that I managed to push through. Uh, but it did not mean that we had senior buy-in necessarily or lots of resources that would follow. And what that forced us to do, uh, which was actually a huge part of the success here, was understand from the business where were the potential opportunities for synergy? What was their challenge? And uh, what was their brief, as it says here? Once we had that brief, we not only took their challenge, we also required them to pay for the process. So it meant that they had skin in the game, because I think it's one thing to find a challenge from the business. It's another thing to find a challenge from the business that the business is passionate about solving. And, and you quickly find that out when you ask for budget. So uh, getting a brief and the budget up front was key. And then we'd go through this three-step process, which we call pitch pilot partner. We'd invite startups to come in and pitch against that solution. We'd then uh, shortlist companies to run a, a paid pilot. And then we would look at, okay, if that pilot is successful, how do we now scale it and roll it out across Unilever? And to give you a few numbers here, uh, the brief, uh, we, we, we accepted lots of different briefs. To tell you the, the numbers uh, for Pitch Pilot Partner, we looked at over, over three years, we looked at over 10,000 companies. We piloted 200. So you could say we said yes to a lot, which is absolutely true. You know, at the time, the next biggest company to work with startups had launched um, pilots with about 60 of them. So 200, we were well and truly ahead of the benchmarks at the time. Um, so we did say yes to a lot, but we said no to a heck of a lot. And I think the key thing here is to go into this 
this process, almost spoilt for choice. Um, so we launched 200 pilots, and of the 200 pilots, about 50% of them, so just over 100, ended up scaling across Unilever. And that brought a huge amount of efficiency, of growth uh, to Unilever. But one of the things that I was relentless uh, about was looking at how do we prove out the business case here? Because my deep belief is that, is, is that if, as uh, innovation leaders, we can prove the financial case behind what we were doing, we will unlock the resources that these things deserve. But a lot of innovation leaders get stuck in you know, innovation accounting, so to speak, and they say, well, no, it's gonna take years and we've got to play a very long game on this. And, you know, and I, there's an element of that that could be true, but I, I don't think that's right. And I don't think that's what, we, um, what will unlock the resources that these things deserve. So we relentlessly tracked um, the startups that we were working with and we looked at how are they bringing solutions to Unilever that are cheaper than traditional ways of working, that are better, so effectiveness and efficiency, uh, you know, click-through rates if it was a marketing technology, how are they better, and how are they allowing us to work faster. And what we found is that over these 200 different pilots and the 100 that scaled up was that they were bringing solutions to us that were half the cost of traditional ways of working. They were 40% better in terms of click-through rates, and they were allowing us to get to market twice as fast. And therefore, you started to see significant, uh, you know, tens of millions of pounds moving from TV and Facebook and uh, Google, for instance, into working with startups. So that was uh, the business case for the foundry. I think uh, just to wrap up, three quick insights here in terms of um, what drove this. First one was that corporate transformation requires transformation from the core. There's no point doing this as a separate, isolated innovation team. If you don't have challenges from the team, uh, from the core business, and ideally budget, then you probably don't have buy-in. Um, second thing, which is related to that, is that the role of innovation teams is not actually to do innovation, but to enable it. If you're sitting there with your own budgets in an isolated team, you're probably never going to change the corporate. But if you can enable innovation right across all aspects of the corporate, that's when you see global transformation. And then the third thing oops, is that uh, um, on financial results, play the short game, and on culture, go long. I think a lot of corporates get this the wrong way around and say, no, we'll change the, transform the culture, and then in five years, we'll deliver financial returns. And we just see that uh, that very rarely ever works. So those are three key insights. Um, and then, of course, be happy to, as we go into Q&A and the discussions here, be happy to talk more about the work we're doing at CoCubed. And we're now working with over 40 different footsies, and there's a lot happening in this space. So happy to share experience from that as well. But let me hand back to Shamin. Wow, that was just great. Thank you so much. And it's great that you're able to take these learnings now and help so many other companies in your current consultancy of CoCubed. And I'm sure in the course of the discussion, uh, you, may, you may be able to uh, share some examples from that work as well. Uh, Shruti, now over to you, please, for maybe about five minutes of uh, your remarks. Thanks. Sure. Shamin, probably, you know, my profile would be um, an illustration of how you know Jerry spoke about corporate startup partnership because I started my career at a telecom based startup. So we were building the 3Gs, 4Gs, and even the 2Gs of the world at that point of time. So uh, Cisco was looking at expanding the practice in the telecom space in the mobility sector. Um, and it was no surprise when Cisco actually acquired the startup called Starrent Networks back in 2009-10 for a whopping $2.9 billion. So I was one of the you know, uh, core team members at Starrent, you know, been through the very early days of writing the very first line of code for, you know, a lot of stacks and then seeing the whole jump from zero to 300 plus huge customers in the telecom space. So that was, you know, a lot of learning for us, um, traversing from a startup to a corporate space. And having been there, done that at startups and having seen the corporate side of the story, I think it doesn't come as a surprise that I wanted to continue to be associated with startups for all the joy, the fulfillment and the learning that it offers. So uh, I began working with the Cisco Launchpad uh, in 2017, so it's been about half a decade right now, and I'm happy to share a little bit more about what you know we work with these startups on. So essentially, uh, I, I want to start off quoting 
Helen Keller, where you know she says that alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And if we want to foster the future, uh, it, it's a very beautiful journey of how we transform tomorrow together. And I'm, I'm going to shift to a slideshow more to make it a bit more interesting. So we see this as a jigsaw of multiple players coming together. You know, Cisco being the corporate player here, the startups are you know, the key partners in this whole scheme of transforming tomorrow together. And it's just not us at Cisco. We believe the partners that we work with, the investors who are part of this journey have a lot at stake here because it's after all, um, you know, giving back to the community using technology as a vehicle. And hence the ecosystem has a very strong play in this as well. So it's essentially the coming together of the different pieces of the entrepreneurial ecosystem that we play in to ensure that the world we live in is much more, you know, a nicer place to live in. And we use technology as the primary medium. So you could see that we've been working with a whole lot of industry verticals mainly under three pillars of enterprise technologies, digital transformation of all sorts. You know, um, you can think of any vertical under the sun, right from satellite technology to mining, to agri, to healthcare, retail. So we've had the fortune, good fortune of working with startups across all of these segments. And the third most interesting pillar that we work on is on the emerging tech space. So things like uh, AR, VR, which were still incubated a couple of years back, we had the good fortune of having built a metaverse space for the startups that we work with. So things like that, which are upcoming, forthcoming, it's a lot of, you know, very huge learning curve working alongside with them, building like the first quantum lab for large defense use cases and such. So those three pillars of enterprise tech digital transformation and emerging tech are like the core areas that you know we focus on industry verticals and as you can see it's just not you know working for the sake of working it, it's about how we provide tangible outcomes for the startups so that it's a win-win at the end of the day so it, it ends up in areas where we are able to give them not only pilots and pocs but also formally bring the startups on board as Cisco's partners. And the funding that you see there on the right side, it's all coming in from the VC community because they are able to see the value such partnerships are bringing to the fore. So 90% is a pretty solid track record that you know, we've had the privilege of delivering for the startups that we've worked with. And if you can see on the map, it's about lot of green areas there with the startups that we've worked with and our intention is to turn more of these gray into deeper greens in the years to come by similar to jeremy we follow a very dedicated multi-staged approach of working with the startups it's a huge journey of discovery because as jeremy was also saying the biggest challenge is in finding what is that big solution that a company or corporate wants to deliver to the world. And if we are able to figure that big, biggest question, then it's a question of finding the right startup partner to work with on the next steps. So uh, we work with the startups right from the discovery space and the green areas of integration is where Cisco's uh, huge strength lies in. You know, given the tech platform that we are able to host, we are able to offer a strong connect with technology as the mining agent and open up joint go-to-market doors for the startups that we work with. So that's in a crux on what we do with the startups that we work with, Shameen. Wow, super. That was excellent, both Jeremy and Shruti. Thank you very much. So just uh, a couple of things to... Um, get our discussion going. And I actually have a, a different question for each of you. Uh, so for Jeremy, um, my question would be more along the lines of if, there, if there's someone in the audience uh, who's in this in a position to uh, initiate corporate innovation, what would you advise and uh, what would your advice be in terms of how to get started? And, in, and, and as you do this, perhaps you could also tell us a little bit about how CoCubed works, because 
uh, my sense is that you're actually helping exactly such companies. And Shruti, in the meanwhile, if you can be thinking about the uh, how companies have been dealing with the pandemic, both in terms of the logistics of managing startup partnering, but what uh, maybe some opportunities have, uh, have, have arisen because of this uh, in your experience. Uh, so Jeremy, please. Yeah, thanks, Jermaine. That's a great question. You know what? I mean, there's never been a more important time to innovate. So I think if, if anyone's thinking about whether or not we should go into this, I don't know if that's a question, really. I think it's a mandate now. The question is more, which is what today's session is about, is, is how to do that. And the reality is, when it comes to working with startups, it's a bit of a zoo. You know, in any industry, you've literally got tens of thousands of startups that are potentially trying to disrupt your core business. So the question is, well, where do you start? And I think it comes back to having that clear vision of like, why do you want to work with startups and, and what are the areas for you? What are, what's that, um, you know, that initial synergy opportunity areas around the synergies that you talk about, which I mean. Um, and then once you've got that, you then need to start to think about the interface. How do we connect them back in? And that's where, you know, I, I think we help a lot with CoCube, just to answer your second question there. Um, one of the things we have been doing over the last two years is working with different corporates and we run these tech immersion sessions. Uh, and those are designed to help expose corporates to new and emerging technologies that are impacting their industry, to open their eyes up to the startup innovation that is happening, and then to take them to a point where they understand what the technology is, how it's um, going to disrupt them, and therefore where the opportunities are to collaborate. Uh, it's hugely inspiring, but it's hugely practical. And that gives us, you know, the first step of the brief, uh, we, uh, the first step of the process, which is that brief, uh, where they can understand, okay, if we're going to work in this space, this is where we need to start. So I think that for me is perhaps a very natural place if you don't know where to get going, um, starting with the tech immersion. If you know where to get going, then start engaging in the startup ecosystem. Um, you know, there's loads of different companies out there that would love to work with you and your corporate, I'm sure. Uh, and if you want help with that, then then that's something that we do as Go Partner. We're really as CoCube, we're really passionate about helping corporates to get close to startups quickly and easily. Uh, and so we do that through global scouting. But there's lots of companies that can help you in that regard as well. Yeah. Super. Thank you, uh, Shruti. Any thoughts on the pandemic and how that's impacted corporate startup partnering? So I think the pandemic in general brought a lot of, you know, a sea change with the lockdowns and the shutdown of the physical workspaces. So that definitely put a huge dent to the old normal, as I would say, partnership initiatives for us. So there were resource crunches, cost cutting, logistics issues, shortage in funding initially because of all of the uncertainty which was there and there was a significant communication gap, you know, again, with respect to the older ways of working. Uh, the biggest blessing for us in this era is definitely the availability of the digital modes of communication and the digital modes of engaging with the startups. So I think uh, worldwide, startups and corporates have definitely uh, gotten onto this wave of digital collaboration. And I think we have been able to get onto this, um, you know, even better mode of partnering with, uh, you know, breaking the boundaries because all of them have gotten blurred and it's more of more or less a uh, level stage for, you know, startups if they are irrespective of their location, whether they are in India or Europe or Australia. So I think, I think it, it's kind of brought in a level playground for everybody today. So the opportunities that I see here is that, you know, the innovation has been the key theme for governments worldwide. So people are looking at newer problems, which means that there are newer opportunities for innovation for which, you know, uh, the solutions haven't come into the mainstream or been adopted. I can give you an example here. Uh, healthcare, for instance, when Cisco ran this uh, digital Vortex study way back in 2016, 17 timeframe, healthcare was, uh, not at all at the center of the vortex. But if you 
come back to 2019-20, healthcare has zoomed into prominence. And for those startups which were ready with those solutions, offering tele-ICU or you know such kind of critical care uh, solutions through digital medium, I think this was really the bus period to capitalize on. So it, it was about the readiness. It was about the uh, access to the right kind of people, access to the right kind of funding. And it took us all the way from idea to impact through innovation. So it has been a whole um, lot of reduction in this shortening of cycle. And that has been accelerated by corporate startup partnerships because you are now able to connect a lot of unconnected dots which were you know present in silos elsewhere. So this connecting of dots became much, much easier because of the larger landscape, larger visibility, you know, whole new markets to get to. Super. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Shruti. And now there are a couple of questions that have come in uh, from the audience. One around uh, the, the big difference in skills between you know, involved in running small businesses versus large corporations. And so therefore, how do you build a mutual uh, understanding between entrepreneurs and managers? And it, it really does come down to people. Plus another question about intrapreneurship being around for decades and, and is it really now here to stay? My own uh, perspective on this has been that actually very often the people in big companies who have engaged with startups like the two panelists we've had have been very intrapreneurial themselves, I would say, and uh, they have fostered entrepreneurship in the company by engaging with people on the outside. But Jeremy, I think you're very well placed to, to comment uh, on these issues, please. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, two really good questions. I think the, the first one in terms of skills and uh, how to best build a mutual understanding between entrepreneurs and organizations. Uh, I'm not sure if it needs to be an understanding. I think it definitely has to be a respect. Um, there's a massive difference between the way that a corporate operates in a, a, and a startup. And that's articulated nicely in this question. How do you then execute on that? Well, I don't know if you need to um, necessarily align, but you definitely have to respect. And what we find uh, which perhaps answers one of the other questions as well, is that, you know, you don't necessarily have to absorb these companies into the co corporate itself. You can partner. So a lot of the best things that we've found coming out of corporate startup relationships are not necessarily an acquisition, um, but a partnership. And, and I believe we're going into a new era of growth, actually, which is not driven by organic growth or entrepreneurship or acquired growth, which is you know, when you buy these companies outright, but uh, an era of growth called leverage growth, which is growth that comes through partnerships. And the way that works is you have legal structure that enables a sharing of value that's being created between these two uh, companies. But from an equity perspective, they're still very much separate. Um, and so I think that's something that's worth exploring if you're looking at getting into this space. Uh, at Unilever, to make it very practical, we had some great examples of keeping a startup um, environment going really well at Ben and Jerry's, I think is perhaps a great example of that. And then some other examples that investors might now question, like Dollar Shave Club, for instance, which is perhaps a good example of, of where it hasn't necessarily worked out as well as investors might have hoped. But when it comes to entrepreneurship, let me give you a perspective on that. My goodness. Um, I hope it's not here to stay. I mean, this is my personal point of view here. Uh, when I was at Unilever in, um, in 2009, I was part of a team that was set up to create the future of Unilever by launching five 100 million euro businesses by 2015. And, uh, and we dropped um, over 40 million pounds of the company's money. We launched 22 different ideas uh, and the whole thing was written off after three years. And, and this is not a Unilever story. This happens in corporates right around the world. I mean, entrepreneurship is tough. Um, entrepreneurship is tough. You've got 90% failure rates. Uh, but entrepreneurship, you know, going back to your boss nine times out of 10, and telling her or him that hasn't worked out again is really difficult. And that's why these things often have quite short lifespans. I think, um, however, I do think there's a need for a build strategy, which is what entrepreneurship tries to solve for. I think the solution to that though is, is build it outside of the corporate. So our process for doing that at CoCube is we bring in rock star founders from outside. We get them to play around with the corporate's assets, pitch their big idea back as to what they would do with that idea. The corporate then seeds, seed funds the idea 
And then you keep it outside of the corporate until it becomes big enough to become interesting. And at that point, you spin it back in. But happy to go into that more if anyone's interested in that. But I think pure entrepreneurship is a, a really tough game. And, uh, and there's not too many, you know, if you look at it as an investment class, it's a disaster. There's a few case studies that make it look interesting, but uh, not enough to make it a good payback. Yeah. Okay, and which is why I think it's important for companies to leverage the entrepreneurship hap happening on the outside. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, uh, we're swiftly getting to the now home stretch. So, Shruti, if I can request you to take on a couple of questions which have to do with acquisitions. And I think Cisco is very well known um, for acquiring other companies, but, but there's a question around, well, how do these relationships evolve? Where do these relationships go? Do they end with an acquisition or does the big company just move on to work with another startup? So that's one um, side of the, the coin. The other, of course, is you know probably a little bit uh, critical, saying big tech companies in Silicon Valley have a patchy track record in absorbing startups. They often acquire them and then don't absorb talent. Are they really changing their tune to embrace startups and all they stand for. What's your sense, Shruti? So let me share, uh, you know, for both of these questions, address these from my own perspective, because I have been through that acquisition um, journey myself. So I think what matters at the end of the day is the value addition coming in from the startup into a large corporate. So now the value addition could happen in an open innovation mode um, through you know, sitting outside and then partnering with the startups, which is, you know, more of the trend these days. And when this kind of gets into a larger value that is being exchanged, I think it's it's like, you know, do you want to date or do you want to get into a long term commitment and a relationship? So that's how we view it. And the open innovation that we are seeing today is kind of minimizing the risk and the investments for the larger corporates to engage with startups, giving them an opportunity either to set the track, the trajectory for a longer term relationship or move on to the next startup. So it's more of uh, fail fast and you know keep moving faster. Or the other aspect to look at it is it, it's about broadening the horizon of influence and impact. So minimizing investment and risk plus broadening the innovation and impact is what would be like a real value gain from both the corporates and the startup point of view. And when they are able to kind of set the stage for a solid working relationship, I think it's going to be definitely a gain for both the parties. Again, about the absorption part of it, a lot of startup employees come in with an entrepreneurial culture themselves. The mindset is extremely startup -y. I think it's very important for the organization and especially the larger corporates to keep you know these different species of people in mind when they work with them because they're going to you know ask for different things not the norm as in the bigger companies but they would want much more of a quicker a steeper learning experience uh the the curve that they have the growth curve the learning curve is quite steeper so if the larger corporates are able to fulfill their appetite for knowledge and fun and adventure i think that's what would really answer the question of how do they keep the patchy stretches in a more greener that's that's very interesting and in a couple of cases i actually found startups having been acquired and then the entrepreneurs who are now part of the big company being leveraged to manage the startup interfaces and so i think these individuals then became effective bridges so i think overall that's a fairly optimistic note uh, shruti so thanks for that jeremy there's a follow-up to what you've been saying and asking whether we need more dynamic organizational structures between big companies and startups I think so. Yeah, I think it's a great um, observation. You know, the natural next step here is to really start to think about how can we, you know, make this happen in a way that benefits everyone. Um, the solution to this is I think we're going into corporates that are much less about a vertical structure of own everything and sort of you have these org charts that reflect that and much more about, um, uh, you know, a structure that is a, a network effect. Uh, let me give you one example that comes that I think perhaps helps to bring this to life. So we were doing some work for Reckett Ben Kaiser, which is you know a consumer goods company um, that many of you might have heard of, and they were creating a brain health supplement, and they faced the question: Well, 
you know, the brain health supplement works okay if you just take the supplement by itself. But if you take the supplement together with you know, a brain gym on your phone, it works exceptionally well. So as a consumer goods company, how do we create a brain gym? And the challenge around that is, for, you know, massive for a consumer goods company. So they don't have a, they're not a tech company at all. They had two options. Oh, that's what they said to us. We can build it, but it's going to take two years to get the clinical results from it. Or we could buy it, and that will take, cost about 20 or $30 million dollars. Um, to acquire this company. And we said to them, look, these companies already exist and they probably exist better outside of records than within. Um, so why don't we look at a partnership model? Uh, we literally went from a meeting like this to in market in six months. So we went from um, you know, this first discussion to a, a market, an in market launch across the whole of the US. They took a company called Cognifit, rebranded the brain gym on their phone to be Nareva. Uh, which is the Breckett's brand, and then launched this Nareva brain system in six months. So it was fast. The cost of doing that transaction is in the low hundreds of thousands. So it's much more affordable. It's much lower risk. You don't have the acquisition risk or the development risk that would go into a buy or build strategy. Um, you just have the integration risk, which is quite minimal, to be honest. And then because you've got the f startup still in play and the startup is still actively looking at how do we grow this business, uh, they're coming back to records and saying, look, this is amazing. We've never grown faster. Um, we're thinking about creating a sleep app to help people rest and rejuvenate overnight. Would you guys be up for developing a sleep supplement? And so immediately you go from not just waking people up in the morning and helping them be on peak performance through the day, to helping them rest and rejuvenate overnight. Both businesses effectively double. Now, what underpins that? It's not equity. It's uh, a bunch of licensing agreements and revenue share agreements. So both companies still extract, um, you know, at least half the cash of what they would if they were to do it themselves. But together, they grow much faster. So you get this nice synergy of two plus, uh, one plus one equals three type thing happening, and everyone wins from that. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much, and a very vivid example. So we're rapidly running out of time, but let's just try to squeeze in one last question. Shruti, um, being based in Bangalore, um, any thoughts about uh, cultural differences and whether you're working for an American company in Bangalore, but you're engaging with startups from around the world, any sense on different cultural perspectives? I think the underlying theme with respect to most startups, uh, or I'd say creators, is to create local and go global. So that's like the universal strategy for the startups. So which means that it's important to have a global perspective and understanding of different cultures, where they are coming from, what their expectations are, and align and customize as much as possible to a whole lot of these. So if I, if I look at um, you know maybe a couple of Japanese customers that we kind of work with, they definitely wanted a lot more of uh, you know language customization for a lot of their documentation. Uh, if we wanted uh, you know some of our startups working with the American customers, they were overjoyed with the kind of profits you know the margins that they were gaining in from there. While we saw a lot of the um, European counterparts, they were very happy to work with the larger volumes that the Indian markets would offer. Similarly, if we were to go to Africa, it was about a story of getting access to a world which was uh, largely you know, giving um, problems which were uh, specific to unconnected world. So newer technologies and you know, you're uh, leapfrogging from you know, one technology or one phase to a different phase. So I think it, it's about you know, how much can you know the other person, how much more. It, 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 it sometimes look like a geography lesson of sorts, geography and history lessons of sorts, even to the startup founders, because you need to learn what you are made of, your DNA, and kind of work with the customers and adapt your products and solution, which would definitely enrich their offerings in the longer run. So I think globally, this is a much needed strategy. I, I don't know if uh, startups even consider to have like a chief cultural officer of sorts going forward, you know, given uh, subjects like design are making uh, more of the mainstream presence these days. I think culture is also an important aspect mm. that, you know, startups in the future have to very keenly look at. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Just uh, very, very briefly, one of the things you mentioned was Africa. 
I have the sustainable development goals showing at the back end. And one of the notes on which I end the book is how my research in Africa has been showing that, in fact, corporates partnering with startups along with other entities, even NGOs or United Nations agencies, can also have a very positive social impact and contribute towards the sustainable development goals. And I think that's one of the exciting aspects of the global aspect of all of this. And hopefully in that way, um, partnering with startups can also be a force for good. Um, but thank you very much, um, Shruti and Jeremy. This was an absolute treat for me. And I, I'm so grateful to both of you for having supported my research, uh, contributed to exciting examples in the book, for your very kind endorsements on the back cover, and also for being part of this panel. So thank you so much. And Stuart, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll um, hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Shamin. Thank you very much, Shruti. Thank you, Jeremy. So gorillas really can dance. Uh, thank you for a great, great session. I think it's uh, the, f the future must hold new dynamic relationships between uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurial organizations and bigger organizations. So thanks for, for mapping it out for us. Uh, I hope people can join us next month, March the 14th, when we're talking to Dana Sohar, Steve Denning, talking about quantum management. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Shamin, once again. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Srufi. Thank you.